my dad would always tell this story about how I rushed down oh the sea rushed into the sea with all my clothes on and then burst out crying when I realized it was wet and cold at Ramsgate when I was a child you couldn't change on the beach or be on the beach in your bathing suits, as it was then. So we put them on and put, covered ourselves up with great big Macintoshes. In my childhood, which was the late 20s or the early 30s, if you wanted to swim, you really had to knit your own costumes. You couldn't go out and buy them as you can today. The dyes were not very good in those days, not as they are today. And I can remember having a very smart navy blue costume, which got dye all over my body, which was not removable, so that my sisters used BIM. They treated me with BIM all over my body to get it off. But of course, you, you can't remove dye like that. It's skin deep. Like postcards from the old English seaside, the memories of Joan Howe's knitted costumes Maggie Pick's tearful plunge into the sea, Betty Oakle's Macintosh bathing, and Dobby Dobinson's indelible blue dye take us on a sentimental journey. Of all the changes in our lives this century, there's nothing that breaks so starkly with our Victorian past as what we do beside the seaside. This classic modern holiday brochure scene might have struck a Victorian as a kind of last judgment on a wicked world. But even for them, the beach was a kind of frontier, a place where you could do what you'd never do at home. There's a crazy kind of logic which took us from the cold, pebbly beaches of Bognor or Brighton to the searing sun of Benidorm. And it has to do with ideas about health and beauty, a cure for the ills of our confined and polluted lives in smoky cities. Walk on, Tom. Walk on. Good boy. Steady. The seaside holiday began back in the 1720s with a new fashion for sea bathing. Hardly anybody could swim in those days and there were no such things as bathing costumes. A new contraption, the bathing machine, was invented in Scarborough to enable the well-to-do to take a therapeutic plunge. Only the wealthy could afford these horse-drawn bathing machines and royalty had their own. This is a replica of the one used by George III at Weymouth. Curator of Wessex Water Museum, Jackie Summers. King George III first visited Weymouth in 1789 when he came to take the waters for his health. Before nine o'clock in the morning, in his bathing machine, he would be towed out into the sea where buxom ladies would be waiting to greet him. He stepped naked out onto the steps of his bathing machine and into the waves. If he was a little reluctant to take his dip, he was encouraged by these very large and fearsome ladies. In the afternoon, you'd take the water again, only this time you would drink copious amounts of warm seawater for your health. The habit of drinking seawater died out in the early 1800s. But throughout the Victorian period, bathing machines were a feature of all seaside resorts, each of which devised its own designs and rules and regulations for their use. This early vista of Dover in the 1850s shows bathing machines littered on the sands. A machine heads out to sea around 1870 at Margate, a resort with strict regulations about how close boats could go to scantily clad bathers. No mixed bathing was allowed. These Victorian moral strictures survived until the earlier years of this century, and a few people like Kathleen Roberts can recall the last days of the bathing machines. The horse pulled you along, and that's what I didn't like because the uh the machine jerked as the horse turned around and took you out to the tide, uh, which I suppose whichever depth they required for swimming. And you went down the steps and into the cold water. 
Ivy Willis remembers the style of Edwardian bathing. The ladies would come down the steps and they'd have mop caps on and very long bathing costumes. Every bit of them was covered up and a little black cape round them and they'd come down the steps and bob up and down. And then back you came up the steps into these cold compartments. You were shivering and the floor was wet and the seat was wet. And also a man would come along and tap on the outside and tell you to hurry up because as your time was up, there was a limit. Only a few people bothered to use bathing machines by the Edwardian era, but they still dominated parts of the beach, as Betty Oakel remembers. My mother used to take us on a lot of holidays, and we never had a lot of money, so she used to leave us two children on the beach at Margate when we were very small, while she went around the town looking for the cheapest digs and the nice best ones. And sometimes she was gone for hours with us children on the beach. But as kids, we had to play in between these horses that were right in the sea. And the smell of the horses, the wet sea on the horses, remains in my nostrils to this day. That peculiar seaside odor didn't last much beyond the First World War. Most resorts got rid of their bathing machines in the 1920s. The northern resort of Morecambe made a celebratory bonfire of them. In the 20s came a whiff of liberation. But the changes were gradual as the last vestiges of Victorianism died. Mixed bathing, pioneered in 1901 by Bexhill-on-Sea, became acceptable. The healthiness of seawater and sea air was still important, but a critical change came in the mid-1920s. It began as sea bathing had with medical fashion. Joan Howe. My mother was very conscious of what was the best thing for children's health, and I remember there was a great deal of talk uh, when one went to the sea, which was part of all good health to get the sun and the sand and so on all around you. And you also would take in the ozone, breathe it all in. Very, very serious this was. And this was all part of um, sort of a kind of health program, good health for, for children and people generally. The evolution of ideas about health and the seaside can be told through the history of Margate's Royal Sea Bathing Hospital. It was founded in 1791 by a wealthy London doctor for the poor who themselves could never have afforded a seaside holiday and a therapeutic plunge from a bathing machine. But the hospital's origins in the medical belief in the curative power of seawater is long forgotten. It was transformed in the 1920s by a new medical fashion for sunbathing. Fresh air and sunlight were thought to be a cure for the biggest killer disease of the early 20th century, tuberculosis. Patients here were wheeled out onto terraces for carefully calculated doses of ultraviolet light from the sun. In time, this new medical fashion transformed what people wanted from their seaside holiday and gave a justification for exposing the body to fresh air and sunlight. When you come out of the water, you should dry yourself immediately and thoroughly. Sunbathing was a novelty in the 1930s, and its pleasures and hazards the subject of patronizing films like Healthy Holidays. After you've dried yourself, there's no harm in having a little sunbathing, provided you don't overdo it. Fine. Sunbathing is extremely popular. I don't know why it should be. Anyway, whatever it is, don't overdo it. Especially if you're like him and don't dry yourself properly. Such advice is now both quaint and topical with our fear of skin cancer. But in the 30s, the health conscious sought the sun with fanatical zeal. 
Sydney Ling. I have an idea, you know, that um, Harry and I and all our friends in colleges, young chaps and girls everywhere, were experiencing a new way of life. I think the sun and the wind and the fresh air were being uh, very attractive uh, aspects of people's lives in those days. Don't forget that when we were in college, TB was a scourge, and Harry and I and most of our chums were dead scared of it. Therefore, we wanted to be out in the fresh air to counteract that. Uh, I wasn't very wealthy, being a poor schoolmaster, and all I could afford was a five pound note for an old army bell tent from the First World War. And it was a very hefty thing to move around. But nevertheless, it served us for some very lovely holidays on the days at Walton, where we pitched it for four or five or six weeks at a time. And it was used all the time by myself and brothers, my cousins, friends from Hadley, perhaps we as many as 10 of us all at one time. We went to uh, some extent to uh, cultivate a lovely brown tinge over our body and we used olive oil of all things. The first suntan lotions were marketed in the 1930s but they weren't widely available as they are today. Sun worshippers raided the medicine cupboard and even the kitchen for their aids to the perfect tan. Lorraine Stallwood. In those days, I don't recall there were all these oils and um, preventives around, but one way that uh, we did find was very good, to cover ourselves with seawater, splash ourselves all over, and then go and lie in the sun, and you could get nearly black in half an hour by doing that if you were dark-skinned. Uh, then I had a friend who used to get a most fantastic tan by covering her legs with Vaseline. And then another one would, uh, vinegar was quite good because it was uh, considered to uh, keep the burning rays out and brown one at the same time. People of my father's uh, generation wouldn't deliberately set out to get a tan, but they would want to return from a holiday what they called coloured up. The generations were still divided on the issue, to tan or not to tan. Pauline Goodfriend, as a young girl, was caught between the two. I remember Granny telling me that men did not expect ladies to be weather-beaten. We didn't use the word tan in those days. But my mother, who was about 50 years ahead of her time and very modern, um, thought quite the opposite. She thought it was wonderful to get sunburned and always lay on the beach looking at, up at the sun and <laughs> undoing her collar, you know. Mum and Dad didn't join in the fun all that much because they remained fully clothed and perhaps Dad would roll up his trousers and his long johns and go and have a paddle in the water or Mum would tuck her skirt in and go and have a paddle too. But we would be stripped down to our shorts and we would be enjoying ourselves. We felt really great. In the 30s, there was a new celebration of the body beautiful, with mass exercising on the beach, a kind of forerunner of the modern health club. Whatever the weather, these Margit girls like a little play and playfulness by the sea, in the company of ebb and flow. They know the Daily Dozen is a good round figure, and we're inclined to agree with them. And sailors do care sometimes. How would they make progress in their study of art? if they weren't afforded such working models. I have seen better dives. What's happened? Oh, Barbara! Why didn't we think... Yes, why didn't she think of the depth of the water before diving? Despite all this beach activity, there was still no beachwear industry. Costumes were homespun. Pauline Phillips. Swimming costumes that I had were usually knitted by my mother. My sister had one when she was 15. 
that sagged so much it finished up with five knots in the shoulder straps to keep it up. <laughs> but we all wore these, these horrible uh, knitted things. And then my mother made me a two-piece one for my honeymoon. Uh, the top of which came off on the first time I wore it in the sea. So <laughs> my experiences of swimming costumes are not all that good. Um, what we used to wear on the beach, of course, as young children, were it was a kind of um, coverall thing that was made of some kind of Macintosh material. And you used to be able to tuck all your clothes inside. It was like a pair of great baggy drawers with a bib front. Um, I've actually still got a picture of myself running up the beach in one of those. Two piece bathing costumes or swimsuits as they were then becoming known were about to come into fashion and as I'm tall I was never comfortable in a one piece because it either wouldn't be long enough at the bottom or, or the top so I decided to cut this through the centre and made what was a very very respectable uh, two piece well above the, the, the waistline but this did not prevent two middle-aged ladies when I was walking along the sea edge from Frinton to Clacton with a friend, looking at me and saying, um, how disgraceful. I was notorious because I had a two-piece bathing suit, as we called them in those days. We didn't, never heard of bikinis. And uh, you showed about two inches of midriff. And of course, I was a talk of the town. The stuff of which summers are made. Sun, fresh air, sparkling water, and lovely girls in scanty bathing suits. And rubber is the stuff of which the new bathing suits are made. So shine down, sun, and blow, gentle breeze. Give us a summer which will make the water a cooling paradise and the long, long bay the chapter of Elysium. The beach was being liberated from old ideas about swimwear, but it was still not acceptable to wear a costume off the beach, as Bill Barber, a drummer with the Hastings Band, found in 1929. We were on the beach, and uh, my friend and I, we were both bored and decided to go for a ride on the motorbike. And I was in a bathing suit, bathing costume, one of these old-fashioned ones with the things over the shoulder. However, when we got to the memorial, that was the centre of the town, the policeman on duty, outraged by the sight of us in bathing suits, stopped us and was telling us off quite loudly. And a crowd all gathered round and listened to this. And uh, eventually he let us go. And uh, I just decided to, to apologise. I wrote a letter. And I had a very nice letter back from the chief constable telling me not to do such a thing again. And uh, so that was all right. The only th thing was, this policeman had the nerve to marry my sister. <laughs> Around the time of Bill Barber's reprimand, a dashingly new feature appeared in many seaside resorts, the Lido. Neither town nor beach, it was a transitional zone for sun worshippers, a place to parade flesh with impunity. This is Cliftonville Lido, just east of Margate in the 30s. All the bathing beauties come out for a new kind of competition and the title of Suntan Venus. Never mind about their faces, never mind about their legs, never mind about anything. Just look at the shade of their skin and then ask them where they found that much sunshine. And as our goggle-eyed cameraman put it, South Sea skirts are provided so the judges won't be influenced by the ladies' figures. But skirts or no skirts, the first three prizes go to ladies from London. What do you think? Lido's became popular venues of that characteristic feature of seaside resorts from the 1930s to the 1970s, the local beauty contest. Former Miss Cliftonville 1967, Margaret Collier. The atmosphere, it was electric. I mean, everybody was on holiday, you'd have families all shouting for, you know, their individual relative who perhaps had entered the competition. For example, you had the Miss Lovely Legs competition. Um, 
there was the Miss Avro competition, which was bathing costumes. You had uh, Miss Grace in Bering that took the way you walked and held yourself, you know. So you, were, you tended to pose a little bit in that competition. There was the Miss Tropicana, where you would dress with a grass skirt, they'd give you a grass skirt, and you would, you'd have to do a little dance. Uh, you had to do your little hula, hula bit, you know, which you felt an absolute idiot doing, but it was fun. But the biggest competition that I won was the Miss Cliftonville, the actual Miss Cliftonville, which was the competition of the year. I was given, uh, obviously, the bouquet and the tiara, the sash with Miss Cliftonville. There were uh, lovely prizes. There was a, a plane trip, which I still have the ticket. I never took the, the trip. And I think it was five guineas, so I was well pleased. There was champagne all round, and you felt quite important. Once the last word in modernity, this Lido at Cliftonville Margate is now a forlorn relic of those brave pioneer days of sunbathing in the late 1920s and of the quaintly glamorous world of the high-heeled seaside beauty queen. Many Lidos like this were built in the late 1920s and 30s on the English coast, but they've nearly all now been abandoned or they've vanished without trace. It was inevitable in the long run that the cult of sunbathing would take people away from the cold water and bracing breezes of the English coast to the guaranteed sun and warm seas of the Mediterranean. The real exodus began in the 1960s. English resorts, which had boasted of their sunshine records, struggled to hang on to their visitors, who were no longer convinced of the therapeutic value of bracing breezes. At Little Hampton, just a bit further along the south coast, the folk are enjoying a normal British holiday, very bracing. But the enlightened local council look after their visitors. For 10 bob a day, they hire out sun tents, transparent plastic domes that keep out the breezes that cause sneezing, but let in the rays on sunnier days. Cocooned in your sun tent, sealed off from the elements, with just a little imagination, it could be the Bahamas. Beauty and the beach took flight abroad. The pleasures of the teeth-chattering dip were consigned to childhood memories. Joan Howe. You always had to have something to drink or eat when you came out of the sea, because that was the thing to do in those days. We always had chocolate or an apple, and Mother used to have a cup of tea from a flask, and then we would play hot rice around on the beach to run around to keep warm. And Maggie Pick. My mum was very keen on swimming. She went on swimming until she was well into her 80s. But my dad used to feel the cold, and so he'd always get out first and make the tea, which he made on a methylated spirit stone. And so I still love the smell of methylated spirits. It takes me back to that great event of going for our swim. And we'll be beside the seaside again at the same time next week. <laughs>